Hello and welcome to this week's video lecture uh, for Searching for Reality. Here we are in week four now, and we're going to take a look at Aristotle, who was one of Plato's uh, students, the only one that we know of. And then we're going to also segue into a period of time between the, the death of Aristotle and several different uh, post-Platonic or post-Aristotelian uh, philosophical ideas, uh, Stoicism, Cynicism, uh, Epicureanism, and also Neoplatonism. And all of that will allow us to then segue into finally Roman philosophy, of which we're just going to take a sort of a brief overview. But we're going to in the sense of the relationship that Greek philosophy had to early Roman thought. So it is, uh, it's a lot of material. I've gone through the slides and I've kind of condensed them down to the essential points, despite the fact that this, there is a lot to look at. But uh, I'd like to start first with Aristotle, who is, of course, a, the, one of the second most important philosophers immediately after Plato. Uh, we're looking at 384 to 322 BCE, before the Common Era. And around 321 was the was a complete downfall of the Greek city-state as well. So Aristotle sees the end of what we knew, as we discussed last week, early forms of democracy and early forms of the of the polis, right, the city-state. So he sees the collapse of these of these uh, institutions, but still, it doesn't stop him from uh, thinking about better forms of a polis, and more important what would constitute a good city-state? And it turns out, short answer, better people, better citizens. So we'll take a look at that as we as we go through his, uh, his ideas regarding virtue. So Aristotle started with Plato in his uh, academy uh, around the age of 18, and he was there for a long time. He spent almost 20 years before he actually started his own school, uh, the Lyceum. Uh, just as an aside, Plato, out of all the people that we've looked at, is the only philosopher who had no other background other than education. That is to say that Aristotle was a physicist and a biologist. Thales was an astronomer. Um, Heraclitus and Parmenides were also uh, biologists or physicists or natural scientists. Uh, Plato is the only one that has none of that background. He is purely an ideas guy, which is why his view of the world is so different than the others we have looked at prior to Plato, and as we sort of return to this worldview with Aristotle, the notion of the material world. Because as I mentioned in the very first set of slides, um, we have these two main paths, right? We've got empiricism or materialism, and then rationalism or platonic thought. Uh, we are going to rely on our senses if we're empiricists, or rely on reason and our minds if we are rationalists. Now, Plato like all good philosophers, try to reconcile these two these two positions and tries to take the bo the best out of both. So we do know Aristotle finally got fed up with uh, Plato and left the academy, and it was uh, it was basically the fact that uh, for the reasons I've just uh, outlined, there were some serious issues with the way that that Plato understood the world and how it how it functioned and how to understand it. So right from the get go. Aristotle's outlook, his philosophical outlook, is very different from Plato's. He, too, obviously is an ideas man, but looks at it from another perspective. He probably will have more in common as we look at people like Francis Bacon, who was a scientist, uses sense data to understand the world. And he subjects that sense data to experimenting and constant experimentation until we arrive at some kind of truth. Aristotle had a very similar outlook, and that's what makes him so different from Plato. He didn't disparage or denigrate the material world. He looked at it as the first step towards understanding the world. And certainly there's nothing wrong with that, because this has been a strategy that other empiricists have used. Now remember, when I say there's two paths, <clears throat> the, the best ones use both sides, right? The best of both have to offer. Of course, they're going to use reason and rationality if the scientists are going to study the world. But the issue with Plato was he completely dispensed with the material world and instead wished to see the world as a, the realization of these perfect eternal ideas. Therein lies some of the problem. Now, uh, Aristotle's philosophical, philosophical outlook, sorry, was, uh, was very important, was very influential, but so was Plato's. And even if you think about 
uh, me medieval theologians that we'll look at next week, uh, you can see them also trying to do the same kind of thing that Aristotle had done, which is to reconcile these two tendencies, the world of perfect forms with Plato, as well as the material world that we are part of, that we live within, right? That we live in. And so this is why the ideas that start in roughly 400 BC continue to have validity, right? Continue to have currency for at least the next 1500 years. And we'll see medieval philosophers and theologians like Aquinas, for example, just talks about Aristotle as the philosopher, right? The one. He is the keystone, the touchstone of the thought that really matters to help us to understand the world. Now, what did happen is during the, the Roman period, that, that thousand years that I've just talked about, um, it's from, from about the year, say, 300 to maybe the 1400s, a lot of this material w became lost. It just it just disappeared. So we have, of course, in 2020, this notion that these texts were constantly being written down. Of course, there was no Gutenberg press till, I believe, the 1500s. But uh, up until this time, everything was rewritten out by hand. And eventually, these texts just simply disappeared. But luckily, because of translations, the ideas of Plato and Aristotle actually continue to exist in, in other cultures. Uh, in the Islamic world, for example, the thought of Aristotle was still a powerful influence. In fact, more so than Plato, surprisingly. And so Aristotle's ideas were still in currency and still uh, in sort of the marketplace of ideas. It just depended on where you were. Now, around uh, the medieval period, right, this is uh, around 1000, well, between about 800 to 1000 AD, Aristotelian thought comes back, right? It comes back into the, uh, Christian theology. So there is a remarkable uh, history and a resilience to both Platonic and Aristotelian thought, although today we will be speaking primarily about Aristotle. So that, that medieval world, uh, and of course the post medieval world that continues on to even the 1400s, um, it is in fact, this really interesting hybrid, right? This synthesis of monotheism, which we, we would attribute to Plato, right? This notion of perfect forms. That's a kind of monotheistic thought, right? A singular one thing that is eternal. So a synthesis of Christian uh, monotheism that has its one foot in Platonic thought, which is this world of perfect uh, forms and ideas that exist somewhere else, and Aristotelian empiricism. So remarkable. This is what essentially Western Christian thought, a medieval thought is. It's a combination, again, of these two thinkers. Now, the difference between the two, Plato and Aristotle, uh, is still worth considering because it is an important distinction between the way that the two of them understood the world. Now, with Plato, we have this notion that we see the particular in the universal right, the particular representation in the universal. So let's say the number two, or the notion of equality. We, we have an idea of it, but we see it represented in that particular object. And so this is the way that Plato would see the world. He would see the, the universal, uh, so you saw in the particular, the universal, but the universal had to be there. That's, that's the perfect form, the idea. So the problem, though, with Plato was that he would look at the material world as somehow this, this constantly perishing, decaying, dissolving, sort of perishing away kind of worldview of what was this perfect ideal world that did not exist in our reality. It existed somewhere. For the most part, it existed in our minds because we have those categories in our minds. When we talk about the color red, if you think of the color red, many of you will have different shades of red. There's crimson, there's wine, there's all kinds of other different shades. But essentially, redness is an idea because we see a variety of these different expressions in the particular. But at the same time, to describe red as a universal thing is actually quite difficult. We can only come up with examples because a thing in itself cannot be grasped. Now, Aristotle on the other hand, saw the universal in the particular. And so we have this idea that this universal thing at that moment in front of us is realized, or as he, calls, as he said, instantiated, right? It comes into being in front of us. So 
speaking, for example, of the color red, right? I'm holding a red apple in front of me, and that is an example of the color red. Now you can be looking outside at leaves, and as they are turning a variety of different shades of red, orange, and so on, we can see other shades of red. But we see uh, there's a separation, all right? That we see the universal, i.e. red, uh, justice, beauty, in the particular thing. It doesn't exist somewhere else, you know, behind a hill or somewhere on the far side of Mount Olympus or who knows where. It exists right in front of us in the unique particular thing that we are looking at. So the idea is not separated from the particular. The form and the idea with a capital I is not separated from the particular, but in fact is embodied, right? It comes into being in that particular thing. They don't exist apart. So what is universal and what is particular are one and the same. They coexist together. And this is something that is remarkably new and different. And it is Aristotle's stamp that we can place on this idea that we see the universal in the particular. So if that is the case, let's kind of break it down again and say, all right, for Aristotle, only particular things, right? Concrete things, material things that we can hold. Now, those things we can hold, right? Depending on what it is, of course. Um, but whether it's the color red or something that is equal or truth and beauty and so on, those examples, right? Those things we can hold because they are concrete objects. And they exist in the physical universe and the material world that we see and the reality that we experience as a substance, right? They come into being. They substantiate something. So these universal ideas are substantiated uh, in the particular thing. We see it right there, one and the same. So we can say that the universal is not a thing because we can't hold it in our hands or weigh it or measure it. A universal is not a thing, but rather a class of things. Those things are all red. Those things over here are all round. These things over here are triangular shaped. So we can see expressed in the particular thing, this universal quality that, that brings together these, these various particular instances, right? These various particular substances, whatever they may be. It could be the uh, triangle that holds your billiard balls in place before you start a game of pool. It could be a slice of, you know, of a pie. It could be any number of, th of things. But the universal itself is not a thing, right? It simply indicates a class of things. These things are red, are round, triangular, are whatever. So the forms are not independent of the concretes, right? They are present only in that they, they concretely exist at that particular moment, at that time. And that's why they can be considered as one of the same. Now, the other issue with Aristotle too is when you think about uh, Plato and his final forms, uh, not to, sorry, Plato and his forms, <laughs> let me be clear, uh, Plato and his forms, we have on the other hand, Aristotle also talking about the different kinds of causes that bring something into being, of which only the last right? The final cause is the one that really becomes important. So let's kind of break this down. When Aristotle is viewing the world, viewing reality, the material world in front of him, he looks at these four different causes, right? He calls them causes that are in operation in the world around us. And these, these classes form uh, objects that we see before us, right? And so it kind of sounds like platonic forms, but something is remarkably uh, sort of at work in Ar uh, Aristotle's thought, which is that he breaks the thing down into these four components. So we have, first of all, the material cause. These would be the material properties of the thing that is changed. Let's say somebody, someone brings in uh, a tree trunk, and that tree trunk is now going to be carved out and a canoe will be made out of it. Let's say we're going back to, you know, a sort of uh, a, in a developing nation or in a uh, pre-literate culture. Let's say we're anthropologists and we're watching uh, these, these uh, you know, a member of the ind indigenous population making a canoe. So let's, let's use that as an example. So the material properties of the thing that is changed, the material property is a piece of wood. Now it happens to be in the form of a tree trunk, but when it is done in its final purpose, it will be a canoe. 
So we have the first one, the material, which is the piece of wood that is now going to be carved into something else. Okay, the formal cause, the current form, right, or the pattern found in the substance. Right now it's sitting on our desk, you know, in our wood shop, because at least uh, in this particular culture, we have something like a wood shop. So we have the material, piece of wood, used to be a tree trunk, the formal pattern that we initially see it in, which is a tree trunk. It's just a chunk of wood. Now the efficient cause is the thing responsible for the change. That would be the individual who is working in that wood shop that takes that piece of wood and carves it into a different form. So material, that's pretty clear. That's the piece of wood. The formal is its present shape, right? The, remember, the present shape is just a tree trunk. The efficient cause is the, the person or the objects upon which uh, this material is worked on. So it could be a chisel, a saw, it could be a number of different things. Those are the efficient causes that changes the formal qualities of this tree trunk into its final cause, which is the purpose for the change. I'm going to build a canoe, right? That's it. So Aristotle is able to, to look at the world and see a, 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 a work different uh, sort of causes that are, that, are, that are occurring at a given time. So uh, we can apply exactly the same thing. If an animal dies in the forest, um, there is the, the material, uh, the, the current form that is in, is in, unfortunately, a carcass. The efficient causes would be all the termites and bugs and insects and things that sort of come out of the ground and also come from within the animal that will just eat it away. And the final purpose is that this animal decays into nothing. It goes, in a sense, back into the ground. So what is remarkable is the way in which Aristotle can kind of break down this notion, right, these, uh, this illusion of platonic forms and say, no, hold on. It could be in, in any one of these four stages, right? It could be in its present shape. It could later become something in its final shape. Now, when I teach this in other classes, I, I like to think of, imagine uh, there is a, there's a businessman, right? Businessman that runs a, a, a sawmill and standing next to him is a poet. And the poet looks out to the forest and says, what an absolutely beautiful sight, a gorgeous, awe-inspiring sight, the rich colors and diversity of trees and plants and shrubbery and the ecosystem and all these beautiful things. And the businessman who owns a sawmill goes, what a nice bunch of hockey sticks, right? That's the way they look at the world. So there is sometimes a kind of negative view of the final cause because it depends on what you're looking at, right? If you're looking at the world and you wish to always sort of use the world to create something else out of it, you'll always be concerned with the final cause. Now, the poet and others may look at just nature and, and appreciate its, its material cause, right? The material cause can simply what you see in front of you, right? The beauty of nature. So it's, it's worth considering. I don't know. It, hopefully the, the point's been made. I mean, we've got these four ideas, right? The, the, what constitutes the, the thing, the material, the form in which it presently takes, the, the work that is done upon that thing, the efficient cause, to, to bring it into it into its final point, its final cause, which is a canoe, a hockey stick, a picnic table, whatever, whatever you can make out of a piece of wood. So that's how Aristotle was able to see the world. Now, that's about as far as we're going to get into Aristotelian metaphysics, because there are many, many interesting ideas, but we don't have a whole lot of time, and I want to make sure that we cover everything. So from this point now, we're going to move on to ethics. And ethics is another very important aspect of Aristotelian thought that has lasted for a very long time. And for example, in my ethics in, uh, ethics in society class, I talk about virtue ethics, uh, which is what we're going to look at here as well. Now, Aristotle fit his notion of ethics and morality into kind of the larger uh, worldview of politics. And so politics and ethics coexist in the sense that they both have to do with the behavior of people. And the way in which people behave in a, in a positive way is, according to, uh, to Aristotle, uh, through eudaimonia, which the translation is flourishing, the, the betterment of human beings. 
to be always uh, in a sense of process rather than product, always becoming the best version of yourself. So uh, eudaimonia or flourishing is an important idea in Aristotle's ethics because it has to do with making the best political structures as a result of these good citizens who come together in a community because Aristotle believed that we were not sort of singular creatures. We needed and we enjoyed being in communities. So Aristotle's idea is that if we belong together and we desire to be in communities, we have by nature to interact with others because we, we wish to be in a community. So that's why his ethics and his politics uh, overlap to a great degree and they overlap in exactly the area that we're going to be looking at. So this notion of uh, eudaimonia or flourishing, right? It's it's more than happiness. Uh, if you ever read uh, ancient Greek, if you ever learn ancient Greek at some period of time, uh, you will find out just how rich that Greek vocabulary was. And this is why sometimes when we translate words, we sometimes uh, don't capture all of the meaning that that word had to those individuals at that time. When we talk about you know, the soul and the mind and love and beauty and beauty and happiness and all these kinds of things. We have kind of an approximation, but their language was much, much richer. And here, at least we can capture part of this notion of eudaimonia, which is not only flourishing, but always on the road to better and greater forms of human happiness. That's why it's more than just happiness. It is that which moves us further along towards that goal. So, it's uh, it's a notion that is grounded in our human nature, and it is also trying to capture the actions and behaviors and thoughts and duties that make for good human beings, right? It's good for us as human beings, especially human beings that, if you wish to believe Aristotle, desire already to live in communities. So it does go much more than just happiness. Of course, that's part of it, but it also has to do with just a, a way of life, a way of living that will make individuals very happy. And so if that's the case, Aristotle posits, right? Okay, why and for what reason is it good? Because he talks about something being good, uh, whether it's for the betterment of the community uh, or the betterment of the political institutions that, that we are engaging with. And he talks about good as something in terms of its function, right? So. What is good is the way in which something functions and the more efficiently, the better it functions, then the more good it is, excuse my bad grammar. So uh, he says, look, the term, you know, the terms, the excellent fulfillment of a function to be a virtue. So the example here, the virtue of a knife is its sharpness or the virtue of a spoon is its roundness and, and its ability to hold something. So the better something is, the more efficient it is. Remember this notion of a final cause? You could even apply that to human beings. If you wish to think of the final cause of human beings, it is to be virtuous individuals living together in a community. So it does all tie together. And it's not as if Aristotle sort of writes the same book and puts a different title on it. He is talking about sort of a range of things that all seem to have a kind of a common purpose. And the notion here of goodness is that Goodness in terms of behavior is considered as virtuous behavior. So the virtue of a knife is its, is its sharpness. And for a human being is to be excellent in terms of one's virtues. So a good person is a virtuous person. So uh, as it says in the slides, if we understand that what, what we are, then we can become the best version of ourselves by becoming excellent at many other functions. In other words, always striving for that final cause and always trying to become the best version that we believe we can be. And we spend our entire life doing this. As we get older, we think more and more about what matters. And it's true. As you get older, you think about maybe fewer things, but you think more deeply about those things because they matter to you as a human being. And Aristotle did essentially the same thing. He was considering the world in terms of its function and even applied that to people. Now, the weird thing with Plato is he didn't apply it to people. He applied it to the institutions. And he was almost geometric in his view of the Republic. And Aristotle comes along and he says, 
No, man, you've got it backwards. You have to come up with good people. Then those institutions will follow through. And it kind of makes sense, right? Maybe one of the reasons why the, the city state, the polis, have finally collapsed is individuals will worry too much about the institutions and maybe not enough about the citizens that populated those institutions. So along comes Aristotle and thinks that, no, this is perhaps the, the way that we should do it. We are going to look to see how we can make the most virtuous and the most, the most good people so that goodness becomes a motivator. So virtue ethics is really what we're talking about here. We're thinking about virtues and these are the characteristics that individuals are going to cultivate all through their lives. And of course, they will change over time. We don't expect an eight year old to be courageous, but we would expect a 25 or 30 year old to be. Um, you would wish the eight year old to be honest, just like you would expect a 50 or 60 year old to be honest. So depending on where you are in your life, certain virtuous behaviors will matter more than others. But a virtue which if you uh, work on these, you will become a better person. And those virtues are character traits, right? Character traits, they're cultivated by education. Uh, in the ancient Athens, they had what was called uh, paideia. And paideia was, if you translate the word, word, more or less lifelong learning. And lifelong learning had to do with spending the time to think about community, about civics, about social interaction and about always being the best version of yourself. Now, having said that, the polis still fell apart. The city-state did collapse away, democracy along with it. But at least at that time, we were given a kind of template that we can go back, we were now able to, able to go back to 2,000 years later and go, yeah, there's essentially an, a lot worth considering here. Because if you think about character traits to be cultivated by education and that will guide our actions in life, you're talking about ethics. That's what ethics is. Because uh, morality, right? Morality is the, is the value system you have in your head that comes from your family, your peer groups, your community, your religious affiliations, any number of things. But the expression of that moral value system is your ethical behavior. And Aristotle felt very strongly about that. He believed that the better citizens we would have in, in, in an institution, uh, social institution, society, and so on, then the better that institution would be, the more robust it would be. And so, yeah, it does have a kind of common sense core. It's true. And you would ask, you know, simply, what would a virtuous person do in this particular situation? What should I do? What ought I to do? And you consider them, you sort of weigh the, the options. And if you have any degree of education, you will know which is the right one. Because at the, at the end of it is, if I were to act this way, would I wish somebody, someone else act the same way towards me? Right? The kind of golden rule. Do unto others that you would expect them to do to you. Same kind of thing is going on here with Aristotle's thought. And he is asking us to consider behaving virtuously. So, it is uh, a new way to consider citizens and to, uh, to consider human interaction. And this is what he means, right, by virtues. So it's a habitual action. In other words, an action that is uh, done all the time. And it's due to character uh, in itself, right? It's, a, it's not a virtue in and of itself. It's a habitual action. Now, what that means is I try to be honest with people all the time. And you become known as someone who tells the truth all the time. You don't do it simply because you notice a particular person is watching you, or you don't hold the door open for someone because you happen to see someone taking your picture. You do it habitually. And this is what me, this is what Aristotle means by, by virtue ethics. It's a habitual thing you do every day. It is part of your character, right? It's part of your characteristic and the way that other people know you. All right. If you're known as someone who lies and cheats, chances are you're going to have a lot of people that wish to interact with you on any kind of, you know, serious uh, degree. So your habitual actions should be based on virtue, uh, not, you know, I habitually steal or habitually lie. No, that's not what you want to do. Your actions should, al should always be based on virtuous behavior. OK, so this is important for Aristotle partly because he knows and believes that we are 
human beings who wish to live in communities together and wish to get along together, he says, but the best way to do it is to simply behave virtuously, behave well to one another. Very simple. Be excellent to one another, as Bill and Ted would say. And that's essentially what he's saying, right? Make it part of your human nature until finally it is also part of your social nature. Because Aristotle stressed repeatedly in the politics that we are both social and pol political animals, right? We wish to be with other people. It's, it's our desire. So we seek out other people. But why not seek out other people who happen to also be virtuous? Because then it will bring out the best in you. And so this is why Aristotle, who was, we don't want to call him necessarily a psychologist, but he understood how other people's behaviors will sometimes even unconsciously rub off on you. If people just do well by each other, the likelihood is you're probably going to start doing the same thing simply because you see others doing it. And it is maybe not rewarded financially, but it is rewarded in and of itself, right? Those friendships are maintained and companionship is, is deepened. And, and there's a level of trust there that is, that is, you know, you couldn't put a price on it. So Aristotle looks at habitual actions, virtuous actions as having that kind of currency. And it is important to look at it that way because Aristotle was always trying to figure out what could make the best community. And that is where he thought uh, it was going to work in the best way possible by having virtuous individuals. Now, when we talk about virtues, what does that mean? Well, a virtue is something that sits in the middle between two opposites. So we have, let's say we'll take the word courage as we have in the slides here. So what that means is courage is a virtue that is in the golden mean. It's in the middle, right? Between cowardice, which is a deficiency, right? We don't want to do that, but it's also not an excess. In other words, a sense of rashness that sure, someone may be courageous, but they don't run up to the top of the hill with a, you know, unloaded gun facing certain death. That's just being stupid, right? That's being rash. You're not thinking it through. So courage as a virtue is that midpoint between not being too rash, but definitely not being too, too coward. It sits between an excess and a deficiency. And that virtuous characteristic is the one that essentially sits right in the middle. And so over a period of time, through experience, social interaction with others, education, we are able to figure out exactly what that midpoint is, that golden mean is in whatever that situation that you happen to find yourself in. Clearly for, for a, let's say a community that is never at war, being courageous is maybe not something that's going to matter very much as perhaps honesty or friendship. So depending on where you live and depending on the situation, different virtuous behaviors or forms of behavior may matter more than others. But that's not to say that they're, they're not virtuous. They absolutely are. <clears throat> so finally here, we're going to take a quick look at, at Aristotle's politics as well. Uh, and as you can imagine, they do fit in with everything we've talked about. You know, our, our final form as human beings is to be a zoon politicon, right? Which is a, a political animal. Now, a political animal, I think for Aristotle would also mean a social animal. Now, the reason why he doesn't call it that is just briefly in ancient Athens, we had the family and we had the state. Society as we know it today didn't exist. Instead, we had the family and the uh, the economic dimension of, of a person's life was tied usually more, more directly to the family than it was to society at large. So when Aristotle says that we are a zoon politicon, right, a political animal, he is implying or assuming that we also understand that society as we know it today doesn't exist. There are essentially these two realms of existence, the family slash economics, and the state. So ultimately, if you wish to say that, you know, society today and politics are tied together, then that's fine. So Aristotle is looking at us as political animals, but political with that very strong social component of us wishing to live together, living, live in communities, because this is how we're going to flourish, right? This is how we're going to become the best versions of ourselves. So having said that, Politics and ethics really work hand in hand. And there's, again, an awful lot of overlap because Aristotle looks at political organizations and communities as something that is natural, 
We just naturally come together because we wish to do these things. And so to flourish within this, this community, to right within this context, is obviously something good. There's nothing unnatural about it. Aristotle believes that living like this together is a good and positive thing, and in fact, is our final form, right? We grow up, we're born, we are raised in a family, then we move out into, again, in this case, into the political realm, but we become the best versions of ourselves because we naturally desire to do that. So we continue to flourish, right? We continue this uh, eudaimonia, and we wish to flourish and be the best versions of ourselves always within that community. And so if that's the case, then Aristotle is also implying that human beings are essentially not self-sufficient, right? They don't live by themselves in little islands and, and take care of everything. We're not Robinson Crusoe, quite the opposite, right? We require society, right? And in fact, if you've ever read Robinson Crusoe, he continuously moans over the fact that he has no one to talk to, he has no one to interact with. So an extreme version, but Aristotle would say, told you so, that's what we're all like. We're not typically self-sufficient creatures. We need others, right? We require society. It's what we wish over and above anything else. So that's essentially Aristotle. Uh, again, a very brief thumbnail uh, uh, view. Uh, you could spend an entire term on just talking about Aristotle's metaphysics, trust me. Um, but at least for now, that is a kind of an overview of his notion of the four causes. And remember the final cause is an important one because that's the one that matters in the other two. We talk about ethics and politics. We see that Aristotle looks at us and our final version of ourselves always being the result of eudaimonia, right? The result of us flourishing and working on ourselves because the efficient cause of that final form is us. It's us constantly bettering ourselves. We go to work on ourselves and indirectly or secondarily, individuals go to work on us and make us better individuals. So kind of a funky way to, to see the see life. But that's that's Aristotle in, in a nutshell. So now at this point here, I'd like to switch gears and move on to what's called Hellenism. And then we'll wrap up with Roman philosophy. Now, Hellenism, where is that from? That comes from Hellas, which is uh, Greece or the the in the, the Greek language, what that is referring to. So the Hellenistic period is something that, of course, did not occur at the time. It was not people woke up one day and said, oh, I must be in this post-Greek or post-Athenian society. No, in hindsight, we looked back and we saw this period of time as the Hellenistic period. So that is what we're talking about here, Hellenism. And it also has to do with the, the, the spreading of these Greek philosophical ideas and cultural components as it slowly moves across the Mediterranean. Now, it sounds, you know, very nice, but the spread of Greek ideas was also through invasion, through colonialization. Let's not forget that. But it's still a spread of Greek ideas and, and cultures or so, some cultural uh, entities. Uh, for example, if you are a fan of mythology, you'll notice that, isn't that strange that ancient Athens, or ancient Greece in this case, had mythology with these various characters. And you look at Roman mythology, and they essentially have exactly the same thing. They just give them different names. Uh, you know, we have Mars, the bringer of war, versus Ares. They're essentially the same people. This is what we mean by the spread of Greek ideas, not just philosophical, but uh, having to, to do with mythology, which, of course, uh, in this particular time is perhaps more to do with their culture than it has to do with, with ideas per se. So it does move across the Mediterranean uh, around, you know, 320, the 320s on towards the year zero and the birth of Christ. And uh, we end up having uh, 31 BC. So that's two years before the, the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ. So in that time period. So you're looking at roughly 300 years. So it's, it's a long period of time that we're going to look at again in a very brief uh, sort of cursory kind of way. So you can take a look. There's a, there's a link here, uh, the complicated history, and then here's a map just to give you an idea of what this actually looked like. But certainly that 300 year period is still very, very rich. So the Hellenes, right? Uh, we, they, their influence and some of their ideas concerning the culture becomes to influence, 
becomes, uh, you know, begins to influence a variety of different areas. And we end up with, uh, with ancient Rome, right? Ancient Rome is, as we know it or right, right now, the first say 300 years, but we have here this, this transition from a post platonic, post Aristotelian, uh, Hellenic world and its influence over a period of roughly 300 years, uh, as it finally manifests itself in Roman philosophy. So we'll take a little step back and we're going to take a look to see what actually was, uh, was, what was going on. Because, uh, in the book, uh, Garter, uh, says that we have this, this interesting sort of, uh, influential force, right? Coming from the Mediterranean as well as from the Middle East. And he calls it this dual origin. And so the dual origin of European thought is actually remarkable. It's on the one hand, a kind of pagan, mythological, or polytheistic, you know, Greco-Roman world, because both uh, Athens, well, in fact, the rest of Greece and Rome, believed in a variety of gods. This was not monotheistic, but in fact, polytheistic, from one to many. So we've got pagan uh, gods in the plural, from the Greco-Roman world, and then we also have this monotheistic and Middle Eastern world. Tom, just a moment. So as I was saying, uh, Garda talks about these two forces that come together in European thought. On the one hand, this sort of pagan, polytheistic, Greco-Roman world. And on the other hand, a monotheistic uh, and Middle Eastern world. And this would be uh, Judaism. And of course, at this point, uh, Islam doesn't exist yet, but it will within a few hundred years of the time that we're talking about. So for anyone who, uh, and this would be a wonderful way to knock down a racist argument that somehow European thought, you know, white culture, you can look at them and say, seriously, have you read a one single history book? Do you even know what Western European thought or European thought actually is? There you go, right? It is a synthesis, right? In this case, a uh, syncretic right? A syncretic bringing together of these different forms of beliefs. And now something is, if you talk about a synthesis, it becomes two similar things that are brought together. And here it's syncretic because they're actually very different. You have on the one hand, this pagan polytheist, polytheistic world. And on the other hand, you have a monotheistic world and they eventually come together in European thought. And of course, the Roman world, uh, by its very nature, because of the, the, uh, the very pervasive and, of course, invasive nature of the Roman Empire, brings this kind of thinking across most of Western Europe, right up to England. So we have, on the one hand, historical movement, right? Physical, actual historical movement over many years uh, by the Roman Empire, but bringing with it this weird sort of you know, sort of a disparate combination of these different forms of beliefs and practices. So this is how we end up with what's called European thought. So if anybody, if anyone wants to be racist with you or somehow say that, you know, there's some sort of level of purity of the white race, first of all, once you're done laughing at them, say, you know, we're actually this. So I, I love this idea. Absolutely love this idea that European thought comes from these two different very, very different worldviews, one pagan and polytheistic and one monotheistic. Uh, and so we know kind of which one has won the battle, although there are still, you know, polytheistic gods and, and deities that others believe. But generally in the marketplace of ideas, uh, monotheism eventually won, you know, won the, we'll say the battle as well as the war. But the fact that it came from these two different forces is quite remarkable. And this kind of you know, bringing together different forms of beliefs is called syncreticism, right? So syncretic thought is exactly what we see. It's a blend of, you know, the medieval the theologians who were monotheistic, pouring over the Bible and studying it, and yet bringing along Aristotle, who comes from that pagan polytheistic world. So quite remarkable. Uh, then much later on in the Enlightenment, that we're going to look at in probably a month or so, uh, starting around the 1600s up to the present day, uh, we know we have the rediscovery through translations of uh, Aristotle's thoughts. Uh, we can see sort of uh, in the you know the work of Dante and other uh, Italian writers of that time, we have a rediscovery of ancient philosophy, specifically Aristotle. 
And so again, more syncreticism, right? More sort of merging together of these different types of, of thought patterns. So again, very, very, very remarkable. So philosophy in the Roman and Hellenic, uh, Hellenistic period is what we want to look at right here. And what happens is philosophy now kind of isn't sort of done in the agora between a couple of different people. It goes from metaphysical dealings and speculations and so on to personal ethics. In other words, it's brought down to the ground. It becomes a kind of applied ethics. And the kinds of applied ethics we're talking about is, you know, how do you live a good life? How can I be a good citizen? What ought I to do in order to be, you know, to fulfill myself, my, my capacities as a good citizen, subject, someone under, you know, a particular set of rules? Not only that, but also, you know, to, to come to grips with, with death, because the fear of death is something that motivates many, many mythological stories. And so philosophy comes along and tries to put that anxiety to rest. And we'll look at that, especially with Epicurus. So what's happening here is philosophy is moving away from this platonic, you know, world of absolute beauty and ideal forms and, you know, I, and all the idea, the rest of it. That's all disappearing. And instead, we're getting philosophy as a way of life, right? Philosophy as a way of being virtuous. Philosophy as uh, eudaimonia, right? Uh, fulfillment and moving towards a best version of ourselves. So it becomes essentially a lot more practical, which is, you know, a, a remarkable thing to consider when we think about the fact that up until this point, we have individuals speaking about metaphysics. And Aristotle is the first one that tries to bring sort of philosophy back down to the ground. And the result once he passes away, are these, these trends that occur during that Hellenistic world. And they all sort of, over a period of time, they, they, there's some overlap, you know, some coexist. But generally speaking, we have this order. And we have four of them, right? First ones are the cynics. These are kind of, uh, well, the slides say counterculture. They, they are uh, kind of counterculture in the sense that they don't follow uh, society and they don't follow some of the trends that would uh, allow someone to be a good social human being. Instead, uh, they emphasize, you know, being frugal, living as simply as possible, up to and include, including never buying a home or buying clothes and really to walk around naked and live in a barrel or, you know, out on the street corner somewhere. They literally rejected everything that had to do with the society they were in, right? Fame and riches and anything that would make living in a society and making the best version of yourself include, uh, let's say, the acquisition of things, right, of property, of objects. The cynics rejected all of that. They simply just walked away from it and said, no, I'm going to live. If a dog can live like this, I can live like this. Now, they weren't feral like wild animals, but they practically were. They, 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 they were individuals who simply rejected every part of social fabric that was known at that time. So we'll, we'll look at them in more, de uh, more detail in just a moment, but essentially that's what they were doing. So we've got cynics who are kind of, you know, lighting up for the, 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 the territory. They want to live under the radar, as we say. That's, that's who a cynic would be. Now, Stoics, on the other hand, uh, kind of went the opposite, but the opposite in the sense that they believed strongly in natural law. Now, natural law is not the law of nature, which is, you know, only the strong survive and at the top of the, you know, the pile is a lion or some strong, powerful animal. Natural law had to do with understanding human beings and uh, human beings wishing, you know, peace and freedom and to be left alone to pursue their own ends. And really a kind of worldview that we'll see again uh, in a few weeks when we talk about uh, uh, social, social contract theory, also based on natural law, primarily freedom right? Uh, freedom and happiness are the two things that are most important to proponents of natural law. And they believed the natural law governed the world. In the same ways that there was a law for, the, for nature, there was also a law for our world. And we should accept that natural law. We shouldn't fight against it, right? So we should accept destiny, whatever that may be. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, you know, your book is written when you're born. Okay, 
to some people, uh, it becomes a way to say, okay, well, you know what? I'm not going to worry about uh, the life. I'm just going to just let it go, right? I'm just going to live my life and see what happens. So if you say, look, you know, your book is written when you're born, you're being a stoic. You're saying, look, don't resist change that is going to occur because it was meant to be. Now, somebody could also turn around and say, yeah, but you know, I struggled and worked really hard all my life and I finally achieved something. They'll go, that's probably what I said in your book, right? You're going to work hard and struggle and, you know, enjoy your eudaimonia and fulfill yourself. And now you've got vast wealth. Okay, the jury's out. But the point is, the notion that natural law governs the world uh, in terms of freedom, in terms of, you know, the pursuit of life and liberty as well. These things are important and that we should accept destiny, right? Whatever whatever life is in store for us, we should accept it with some level of grace and not, not fight against it. Which, if you could imagine in a slave state, would excuse an awful lot, right? So let's let's always remember to put this in a context. Now, the third, uh, which I the individuals I find most interesting are the Epicureans. Now, Epicureans believe that pleasure was the highest good. And we will be very clear on that because we need to define what pleasure is. And pleasure is simply an absence of pain. That doesn't mean actively looking for pleasure, but minimizing pain. So almost by default. So yes, pleasure may be the highest good and pain is bad, but pleasure in this case is not some sort of, you know, I'm going to have this fantastic meal or I'm going to make love all night long. These are ephemeral temporal things. Pleasure is serenity, uh, peace of mind, a clear conscience, the ability to just contemplate the world. And so it has, it, there's something very Zen about it. So I'm almost so Buddhist about it, you know, to just simply connect with the world on a higher level and to say, there are things I cannot change. And I'm simply going to minimize the stress. I'm going to accept the way things are and aim for pleasure. But by that understanding, I'm simply going to rid myself of pain, whatever that may be. So pleasure with Epicureans, again, pleasure in the Greek language versus what we translate it to, we need to be very clear because it's not a sensual form, but rather serenity, peace of mind, easing of the soul and contemplation. And finally, the kind of the trippy one is uh, Neoplatonists. Uh, it's kind of mystical, uh, this notion uh, from Plato that, you know, that we get closer to the one, we get closer to these perfect forms, which is to say, again, Plato never disappears altogether because we have, you know, cynics and Stoics and Epicureans that seem to be kind of grounded in the material world, but not far behind, right, are the Neoplatonists. Uh, and they are very much enamored with with ideas, right? Almost a kind of second order reality. And they, they uh, adore these beautiful forms. And they think that the forms and us are simply part of the one, right? This huge bubble of which we're all part of. So it's partially uh, based on Plato's notion of forms, but also in that Parmenidian, right? That we saw a couple of weeks ago with the, the end of the pre-Socratics, this kind of Parmenidian one that everything is all connected together. It's a beautiful thought. Right? It really is, because at the very least, you would probably take care of the environment if you felt that you were connected with it. So it does still have some merit. So let's start, first of all, with the, the cynics. Now, cynics, when people say they're cynical, like, you know, eh, this is horrible, eh, what's the point? It doesn't mean that. It actually is part of the translation of cynics having to do with dog-like, right? And this is why they were known as the dogs of philosophy. So we'll look at the first ones. Uh, okay, so here's four reasons why the cynics were named such. The first one is they had a completely indifferent view of social life, right? They just were indifferent to everything else. Uh, if they felt like doing something, they did it in front of people. And you can imagine uh, in this day and age, they would be breaking laws, you know, obscenity laws and indecency laws and, you know, urinating on the sidewalk. That's what they were like because they figured, hey, a dog would do it. Why can't I do it? So as you can imagine, <laughs> cynics were uh, at times rather rank and bordering on obscene in their behavior, but they were indifferent to social life. They were indifferent to decorum and duty that was expected of individuals because they essentially just rejected it. They were, they were indifferent to the world that they were living in. So yes, on the one hand, living in a material world, 
but at the same time somewhat disconnected from it because they simply were not going to follow decorum, you know, duties, uh, just proper behavior. Didn't matter to them. They were indifferent to it. The second one is they were also shameless. They did whatever they wanted to do and say, look, you know, uh, the shamelessness is actually a good thing. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. And if I want to, you know, take a shit in the sidewalk, I will. That's rank. It is. But they would look at that as something good. I'm in charge of my own self. I can do what I want. So yeah, having a cynic over, din over for dinner, you might want to think twice about that. So indifferent to the ways of life, they were indifferent to shame. Uh, yet at the same time, they were also like guard dogs, right? They, they would fight and argue for their particular worldview and fight as hard as they needed to, to prove that what they were doing was right. And the fourth, fourth one is like a dog. They believed that they could distinguish easily between someone that was for their cause and someone who was against their cause. Um, this little link here from uh, Wikipedia can give you sort of more details, but I'm giving a very, very brief kind of overview of the cynics. But that's essentially what they were, they were like, like consider the dogs of philosophy. So indifferent to social life, uh, had no sense of shame. Uh, they would fight sometimes to the death for their belief system and thought that they could actually distinguish someone that was on their side versus someone who was not, much like a dog would. So that's the relationship between them and being called the dogs of war. Now, the Stoics, on the other hand, a little bit more, uh, you know, socially friendly, we'll say. Uh, the Stoics, like I said, they believed in a kind of natural law, right? And this natural law uh, influenced individuals and our, our way of life and the way in which we would behave. And so they said, look, the the best way to live our lives is to simply ensure that our will lines up with natural law. If natural law says that we should be free, let us be free. If we should, if we must pursue happiness, let us pursue happiness. So they were not necessarily uh, antisocial, but the Stoics did believe that natural law could explain an awful lot. The way that things were had a lot to do with following natural law and saying, listen, if this is what is going to guide and motivate us, why resist it, right? Let, let us be free. Let us be happy. Let, let us do the things that are going to bring this into fruition and maybe not struggle against it so much. So uh, Stoicism was, as uh, you can imagine, at times, you know, interesting and important to the Roman world. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, for example, was a Roman uh, emperor who did believe that the Stoic way of life was a good one because, let's say, freedom and happiness, however they are brought into, into being, by the very nature should be should be a good thing because you're certainly not being a, a cynic right you're not doing obscene things out on the sidewalk you're in fact behaving correctly but you're also letting natural law take take its course now stoics in the roman empire there, there were many right uh it was a kind of unofficial philosophy and the notion of you know duty and sacrifice because it gave them pleasure and it gave them a sense of belonging in, in society. Uh, ultimately, if you are going to be guided by natural law and you're not going to resist things, that means you have a certain degree of self-control, right? You know that that sense of self-control is there providing you let natural law unfold as it should, right? No matter what happens, right? You can choose to react to it in a virtuous way, that is with reason and calm, and you look at something that is new and uh, unexpected and say, well, this is what was meant to be. I need to deal with it in some way, and I will deal with it in a reasonable and calm fashion because it is what has been given to me right now. This is my lot in life, and I need to do the best I can. So if you are unhappy, it's because you are ignoring reason. You are not, you are not uh, approaching this obstacle with reason and calm. You're in fact trying to fight against it. And if you do that, if you're fighting against something, you've lost in, to a degree a sense of self-control. Now, what is uh, really remarkable is both in Greece, uh, sorry, both in Athens and in Rome, slaves could buy their freedom, which is why we have uh, the, one of the most famous Stoics, 
was uh, Ep uh, Epictetus. Epictetus was a Roman uh, Stoic, right, a philosopher, but born a slave, was able to earn his freedom. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, uh, the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. So uh, Epictetus, as the, as the uh, slave, saw his lot in life and thought, okay, well, this is, I have to make the best of it. Now, this is remarkable. I mean, a slave looking at his situation and saying, okay, well, I don't know whether he was born into it or he was captured, but he tried to make the best of his situation. And the end result is that he actually made out rather well. So what was happening was stoic virtue, right? This is what they called it, this notion of being virtuous and looking at situations not as, you know, insurmountable obstacles, but perhaps something that need, need to be dealt with from a different perspective, but always using calm and reason. And if we could be virtuous, we could then sort of balance the world and the obstacles that it places in front of us with the fact that we are going to be virtuous. We're going to uh, approach this reasonably, calmly, assess it for what it is, and see if we can make the best of it. So a Stoic had a sense of virtue because they were following natural law, looked at things not as, as re a resistance or an obstacle, but simply something new, something new that needed to be dealt with. And so uh, the only way to, to acquire or to maintain happiness was to simply go with the flow. And essentially, that's what it was. And uh, Marcus Aurelius, for example, uh, was very clear on how people could see that out, you know, that world and the events. And he actually says, you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. If you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it. And this you have the power to ev to evoke at any moment. So he's saying that it is the power of mind over matter, the power of the mind over the situation and over the obstacle, which is a pretty remarkable way to look at the world when, you know, Rome was still a slave state. And it was possible for a slave to become free. So it wasn't, you know, if you were either born or became a slave, that was not necessarily it for the rest of your life. There was a chance for something to change that could be an opportunity. So if you go with the flow and you just let things happen as they should, you, with the power of your mind, can overcome that obstacle and realize that you have strength. And the strength is in how you view the obstacle, how you view that particular pain and what you do with it. So it is. it, it was an interesting way to overcome some of the, the difficulties in the world to think that you could rely on natural law. This was meant to be, right? My book has been written for me, but I'm going to go with the flow and my mind is going to keep me from viewing this issue as an obstacle, right? It is simply something I need to work through. Okay, so that would give people at the very least peace of mind. Now, the next group I want to look at are the Epicureans. And Epicureans and Epicurus in particular uh, they had uh, an interesting relationship to the pre-Socratics because Epicurus was also an atomist, much like the Democritus that we looked at uh, two weeks ago. And Epicurus took it a little bit further. He said, look, both mind and body. Now, remember back then, mind and soul were kind of collapsed into one. And the immortality of the soul was a very important concept to keep in mind. And he argued, no. Body and mind, or body and soul, are made up of atoms, of physical material things. And when the atoms of the body, right, dissolve away, the atoms of the soul dissolve away too. So, wow. You could imagine Epicurus saying that and people essentially sort of freaking out. But he's saying, no, no, this is just the way it is. Look, you know, when we die, it's the end. The soul does not survive death. It is not immortal because it is made of matter. There is no afterlife. So, you know, death is nothing to us since while we exist, we exist, death is not a thing. But when death exists, we are no longer. Very simple, very elegant view of the world and our, our place in it, our life flow, if you are, our life cycle, if you like. Because 
at this time, there was still a tremendous amount of grief and anxiety over uh, the mythical gods. Maybe not so much the stories, but the mythical gods were still considered to be quite powerful. And Epicurus comes along and tries to um, appease the anxiety that people have. And one of the ways in which he did it was to remind people, you are made of atoms. You're made of stardust. You're made of whatever you want to call it. And when your body dies away, your mind dies away. Your soul is gone. And that is the end. And don't fear death because you're not going to feel anything. When you cross over, that's it. When death comes to be, we cease to exist. Now, dramatic, yes, maybe harsh, but it was the way the Epicureans were able to sort of figure out a way to let people know that, you know, the afterlife is not some, something to worry about. You will not be visited by gods and goddesses that will torment you. When you die, you die. That's it. So Epicureans um, wish to sort of look at the world and say, okay, well, fine, even if there's no afterlife, that doesn't mean I have, you know, a green light to go and be an awful person. Because he said also that what is good is pleasurable and what is painful is evil or harmful. Now, self-gratification and stuffing yourself full of food that you really like and, you know, getting really liquored up and throwing up the next day, that's not Epicurean uh, delight, right? That's not his idea of pleasure. Uh, what he is, what he's talking about here is well-being, right? Well-being that's based on, at times, sometimes intangible things, right? Friendship, uh, contemplation, the modest fulfillment of basic needs. Not as far, not as bad as the cynics, right? He doesn't reject everything, but what he does reject are the things that would cause grief. Now, for example, Epicurus believed that individuals should not get involved in politics because that would cause them an, an off, not only an awful lot of stress and grief because it's not easy, but you also would not be a true version of yourself because you'd be promising things to people and promising, you know, to deliver on things that you clearly cannot or will not. So you should be troubled by these things and you won't sleep at night because you have a conscience. So contemplation now will be troubling. And trouble, trouble is bad. Trouble is painful. Trouble is evil. So uh, Epicurus and, and his group, the Epicureans, uh, actually basically left the city-state and lived in kind of communes. And they lived in what was called the Garden. And so the Garden was this kind of area away from the city-state where uh, Epicurus and former slaves and women, which is, again, this remarkable thing, Epicurus welcomed everyone welcomed everyone that believed in what he was saying you know that after after when death occurs we dissolve away and there's no afterlife there's no pain there's nothing for us to worry about and instead we should we should pursue pleasure as a lack of pain a lack of evil and we do it through moderation and tempered behavior friendship contemplation the the modest fulfillment of these needs so what is really sad is when someone is called an Epicurean now uh, in the 20th century or 21st century is a, a glutton. So uh, someone who's an, an Epicurean is somebody that stuffs themselves and, you know, gores themselves with food. Quite the opposite. In fact, absolutely the opposite. That is not what Epicurus was about. So it's really, it's sad that his name is now associated with this because it never was in his own lifetime. So one of the things with Epicurus is as he talks about life, he also talks about the various aspects of life and the problem of living. And in this particular case, the problem of evil. And that is a, an issue that is sort of later on become, it becomes part of theology. But here's Epicurus. Remember, we're going to try to take philosophy and make a way of life out of it. And he talks about the problem in evil. And he says something remarkable which makes him sound almost like an atheist, even though he was not. And he says the following, Is God willing to prevent evil, uh, evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? willing? Then why call him God? That's pretty shocking. Right? So the problem of evil is it exists and the relationship now becomes God 
and the existence of evil. Uh, other theologians will come up with all kinds of uh, different, uh, you know, explanations. One of which is uh, evil exists in the world, so we have a choice. And if we make the right choice, then we are going to be more, you know, looked at in the eyes of God as better people. But there's evil. If God created a perfect world, why did he create evil? And that's kind of the viewpoint that Epicurus has is, if that's the case, why are things so awful? Like, why is the, the world such that it is? Because it is a problem. And, you know, if God is willing to prevent it, but he's not going to, then he's not all powerful. Or if he's not willing, then he's malevolent, right? He's w wishing to inflict this kind of terrible pain upon us. Because, you know, if evil comes from free, from free will, as I mentioned, uh, the th other theologians think about it and say, uh, you know, it's there. We have a choice. Uh, although they also argue that it seems to be easier to be evil than it is to be good because it seems to be always an uphill battle. Um, Epicurus still thought that this was important. Why? Because it was part of this larger debate about this fear of death, right? And the fact that, you know, gods could be a, a threat to, to this sort of contemplated world or this world of tranquility that we try to live in, but still we could be troubled by, you know, the fact that evil exists. Uh, there it is. And Epicurus, you know, again, let's be clear, he was not an atheist because he did say clearly in his writings, if you believe in God, worship him. You know, worship that God that you believe in. You believe in. The issue, though, is that gods are remote. They they don't interfere in our lives. They're far away, busy doing other things. So uh, Epicurus is not an atheist as much as he is a deist. And a deist is a person that believes that God, in a sense, is like the perfect watchmaker. He winds up the watch and he lets it go and does not interfere with it after. He lets that watch go on. So Epicurus was a deist, right? Um, believing in not an uncaring God, but um, a God that does not interact directly into the real world. So this is, again, something we'll look at a little bit later on, but these are ideas that start this early. Now, one of the disciples, as we move into uh, Roman philosophy, one of the really interesting uh, disciples of Epicurus, and again, someone who whose book was lost to history for many hundreds of years, because it was written, uh, you know, sort of, well, let's see, 200 years after Epicurus. So like by uh, the first hundred years, it was written because he was around from 99 to 55 before the Common Era. So he was, uh, he was around, let's say, 55 years before the birth of Christ. But the book he, uh, he wrote, and there's a link for it right here, on the nature of the universe is what it tra translates to in English. That particular book is a... Uh, sort of distillation, right? It's a compendium of Epicurean philosophy uh, in a beautiful book and is uh, uh, just really worth a read. If you're going to read anything from Roman philosophy, I recommend uh, this book because it does, in a poetic form, uh, revisit many of the themes that are initially looked at by Epicurus. This idea of, you know, a kind of universal, atomistic, you know, causal explanation of the world. Uh, again, going back to the notion of materialism and matter and atoms. And again, the difference between Demo uh, uh, Democritus and Epicurus is Democritus talks about the necessary movement of atoms. Epicurus takes it in the opposite direction. He says, no, everything is random. Everything is random. So if that's the case, we can't talk about the necessarily, the necessary movement. It is random. So, uh, Lucretius, talks about the same sort of idea, right? This this atomistic causal explanation of natural phenomena, how things come into being and perish away. He also is uh, defending the notion of free will because instead of following natural law and saying, oh, well, you know, things are the way they are, we can fight and struggle to maintain our eudaimonia, right? Our fulfillment and allow ourselves to be the best versions that we, you know, that we can be of ourselves and still move because we have free will. We can make choices. We can make decisions that will impact our lives and others who are around us. So another one is also the answer to the fear of death and misfortune. Uh, misfortune. Uh, Lucretius is essentially arguing the same as Epicurus and saying that, look, upon death, everything's over. There is no afterlife. 
uh, there is, you know, there is no God that is going to torment you. There's no heaven and hell. It just ends. That's just the way it is. And of course, that in and of itself is a, uh, a refutation, right? A disapproving of the notion of the immortality of the soul. Now he's writing, right? He died in 55 BC. 45 years later, along comes Christ. So these are ideas that are in, you know, in the air. Uh, now, Judaism had been around for probably a couple of thousand years, even at this point, that was monotheistic. Uh, now, they, you know, they had a monotheistic God, but did not have the same sort of uh, trappings of Christianity with heaven and hell and so on. They, you know, that view was of the afterlife that we see here is closer to Ju Judaism than it is to anything else. But here is uh, Lucretius just like Epicurus saying, no, there is no afterlife. When we die, we die. It's over. And that is in order to allow people to just calm down and just sort of, you know, contemplate the wonderfulness of the world as it presently is, rather than worrying about, you know, well, in the future, I'm going to live in a better place. This is not even in, in the equation at this point. It's before the birth of Christ. So we have, you know, we, we have individuals like Lucretius was saying, no, those who have religious thoughts at times are the ones who are doing evil. So the worst case scenario is that religion is not assuaging people's souls, but in fact motivating them to do evil, which is quite the opposite for what we, you know, normally were expecting. So Lucretius and Epicurus have a very particular view of the afterlife, of the soul, of the fact that mind and body were one, you know, one kind of matter. There's no distinction between the two because they're all made from atoms. And then once we die, we literally, utterly and literally cease to exist. Now, our memory will live on and our afterlife will be what we leave behind with other people. So if you want to think of an afterlife here, it's, it's people that you have no control over talking about you. And if you were a decent person, then they will say good and kind things about you. If you are a horrible bastard, they will say that about you. So what uh, Lucretius and Epicurus are implying here is if you do well, if you do good by others, then you will leave a good afterlife. You will leave people speaking about you in positive terms. You know, how much you, they miss you and how much they, you know, they enjoyed your, your wisdom and your truthfulness and all the things that are, they are associated with you as a virtuous human being. Instead of saying, well, you know, I didn't get caught, but, uh, you know, hopefully I'm going to be okay and I'm going to go to heaven. Uh, these ideas don't even exist at the time. They're just not, they're not in the marketplace of ideas. So, um, Lucretius, Epicurus, and Epicureans did believe that body and mind were one material substance, and upon death, it was gone. It was that was that was it. So, body, a, a brain and mind, right? Both the idea and the thing itself grow, develop, right? They grow and develop together, and what we, you know, what we do with our lives really matters upon the way in which we engage our minds in that physical existence that we have with ourselves and with others. So if that's the case, and if we do well, and we live and we abide by these rules, and we are virtuous and we, you know, we are moderates and so on, then we shouldn't fear death, right? Death should not be something feared. This is a remarkable thing that Lucretius and prior Epicurus are presenting to us, that death should not be something we fear that all good and bad occur in experience and death is at the end of all these experiences it ends it utterly ends so just as we did not fear the time before we were born we should not fear the time after we die and so these are quite remarkable words because they're just not the kinds of things we start hearing over the next thousand years as christianity sort of takes hold um by about the year 300 uh, the Roman Empire believes that the only thing connecting all these disparate cultures that they have overtaken and, and colonized is this belief in Christ. So they say, well, you know, let, let's buy into it. And Roman Catholicism is born. Around 327 um, in Constantinople, that's why, that's why the, the connection between Roman Catholicism and Christianity, they occur at that point. So these ideas are there in circulation. But the time we're, we're talking about is just before, 
just before within within almost a hundred years and in the case of lucretius within 45 years of the birth of christ so what are these two philosophers one uh, one greek and the other roman what are they talking about they're talking about the philosophical tranquility of spirit the the lessening of of troubles and agitations about the world and so tranquility of spirit ultimately is the best pleasure possible and think about it a clear conscience being able to sleep at night and not being troubled by things so if we have a calm and serene mind likely we're going to be able to live a good life right we're going to be untroubled by death we know that when we die that's the end of things suffering excuse me <coughs> suffering desire deprivation all these things all the things that make us that make it hurt we can abide by them because they will be over so uh epicureans right they argued that indifference was only important only if it is you know the troubled mind is able to sort of push it away and okay so it's important only as a troubled mind prevents enjoyment of life's simple ple pleasures if we spend so much time trying to sublimate and push down into our unconscious you know troubling things rather than dealing with it and getting it out of our system you know getting it out of our minds then we probably are going to be better people so this is something that we need to consider so an epicurean would try to avoid pain and trouble as much as possible many things that they can do right live modestly don't seek fame and power don't get into politics and so if you can do that the likelihood is that you're going to live a rather you know a rather tranquil but good life so the last people i want to look at here because we've been going for about an hour 20 minutes is uh, neoplatonism which is again a very sort of small period of time but uh, the neoplatonists uh are part of this uh you know sort of the time leading uh, from the birth of Christ to about the third century. Uh, Plotinus, for example, is probably the most important figure. Uh, he was also a dualist, a dualist in the sense that he looked at the separation between the world of ideas and the world of matter, right? So the material world and the abstract world. And again, a focus primarily on the abstract world as the better of the two, which is very much like the way that Plato was looking at things. And here we have, you know, uh, a span between these two, these two ends. And one end is the one, right? This perfect manifestation of everything, perfect ideas and forms and perfect versions of us. And the opposite is nothing, right? Emptiness, nihilism, chaos, nothingness. So we need to remember that the world is suspended between these two extremes. Now, at times, we veer, we veer off towards chaos. Other times we veer off towards perfection and the one, right? This sort of uh, embracing of everything else around us. And it has a beautiful, you know, sort of sentiment to it. To be part of the one is quite a remarkable thing. But we can be one with nature. We can be one with the spiritual world. We can be one with all kinds of things. But what gnaws away at us and destroys that that perfection and that perfect connection is the the opposite. Chaos and nothingness and nihilism. So we... We, in a sense, live between these two poles. Um, Plotinus also said that we also exist midway between the gods, right, this perfect world, and beasts, which are still not emptiness or nihilism, but certainly well on its way. So this is this is the choice we have. We, you know, we live we live in these suspended between these two tendencies. We'll say. So uh, Plato talked about the one end, right. Uh, this world of gods as the world of the good, the world of perfection, the form of forms. Uh, Plotinus talked about it being divine, right? This divine world. So there is the, the connection with, with religious thought and monotheism. Uh, and he says essentially that, you know, the one is this ideal potential, right? That we should always move towards, but it is also informing everything else, right? It is something we move towards but also is influencing where we are at at the present time. So it is an ideal, right? A potential, but without it, nothing else can exist. This kind of idea we'll see a little bit later on when we talk about uh, talk about Spinoza, because Spinoza's thought about the position of God in, in nature is not unlike a similar idea that we see right now with, with Plotinus, is that on the one hand, we have this, this totality, what he calls the one. 
and the one is per perfect and divine and we partake in it but there's that pull away from that from the one towards chaos and bestiality you know and, and sort of subhuman behavior and for us to be good human beings we need to maintain that suspension right those two forces and kind of that's essentially what he's arguing so all things come from this divine creation and again this is this is monotheistic theological thought uh and of course when we consider like a godhead we consider that as perfection in every way now that one of course has no attributes it is self-sufficient it exists onto itself there are no attributes that it needs it it generates everything again this is very much like spinoza that we'll see in a few weeks but this notion of the one right it's beyond all attributes it is everything and change duality you know existence and non-existence everything just is it purely and utterly is it's simple and perfect but the beauty of it going back to plato we participate in it we we connect with it through our reason so all existent things including ourselves and animals and things are manifestations right of this transcendent divine one so again if you're an ecologist or an environmentalist this is a beautiful idea because what better way to connect with the world than to think of it that way that we are part of nature nature is part of us we are part of the animal world and they are part of us and so on and so on and that relationship needs to be maintained it is a very yes mystical but certainly something that is not out of the ordinary for us to think about if let's say if you're agnostic or atheistic you could still take out the word divine and say a transcendent one right we are part of this totality this part of the one and you'll see these ideas come up a number of times in you know in our search for reality whether it's parmenides or plato or plotinus or spinoza that we and god and nature are all interconnected you see it in hegel as well the fact that there is this this connection this oneness this connectivity the difference is we have attributes and this one is beyond that right it doesn't need any attributes it is utterly utterly unique it is utterly self-sufficient so a remarkable way to to look at the world so finally the the last idea here is ultimately we're moving into mysticism right uh this notion of this sort of ineffable experience so ineffable is something that you try to describe but words fail right you you can try poetry you can perhaps use music uh and that, that's why sacred music sometimes it sounds gorgeous uh choral hymns from the you know 12 and 1300s seem to have this quality of utter sacredness and utter beauty because they're trying to describe right the composers are trying to describe something that cannot be described in words so that uh, ineffable experience which is what the uh, the ideas that initially belong to plato then sort of reinvented and taken further by plotinus uh is exactly that this because something that is ineffable or ineffable is implying emerging with god or emerging with oneness emerging with perfection uh, and on page 135 for example of the textbook uh, Garda uh, quotes uh, Silesius every drop becomes the ocean when it flows oceanward just at last the uh, the last soul ascends and thus becomes the Lord so there's a sense of flowing into this larger body of water and we see the uh, the notion for example with Freudian psych uh, psychology he talks about the oceanic right this sense of oneness um if you love ambient music for example you get that sense of oneness you're enveloped in the music um heroin addicts describe similar things a oneness with everything around so maybe mysticism but the notion of that ineffable experience that cannot be described in, in words that sense of dissolving away uh, losing oneself it goes this far back it comes it comes from these ideas initially in plato but taken further by the neoplatonists and this notion of losing oneself it is a, a common occurrence uh, and many different cultures around the world and throughout time have given us versions of these same ideas 
uh, typically given religious dimensions, uh, ritualistic dimensions, uh, dimensions, but the notion of fusing, right? The fusion with the divine or fusion with the oneness, that's, that's the common characteristic, but it actually starts this far back. So however that's achieved, uh, just remember that this is where it comes from. So that's essentially it. A uh, lot of material to cover in this particular one because we looked at almost uh, 300 plus years worth of material. Uh, in fact, if you want to go 600, if you start with Aristotle, so 300s right up to 300 AD. So 600 years worth of material, a lot of things are going on up to and including the birth of Christ, which then sends things in a different direction. And we'll look at that next week when we talk about monotheism.